In 2010, as Ireland was in the depths of the last economic crisis, a house on Pembroke Road in Dublin was put up for sale. Selling this house was always going to be a challenge, given credit was tight and the building, that was nearly 200 years old, was showing its age. The interior was dark and gloomy, with little sign of previous occupants. The rooms had faded wallpaper from a bygone era, which clashed with ageing carpets. The rear of the house was in even worse condition. Although semi-detached, the gateway to the side of the building had long been blocked up, creating a strange, dreary courtyard. A series of ramshackle sheds only added to a general dilapidated appearance. Nevertheless, the estate agent did what they could and adopted a creative approach, urging prospective buyers to have hard hats and boots at the ready. Despite its numerous shortcomings, the house was sold and predictably the new owners gutted the property. A large extension was added to the house itself while the yard to the rear was transformed. The wall that created the dreary courtyard was demolished and replaced by a gate, while the dilapidated sheds were levelled to make way for an urban garden. While this renovation was practical, indeed sensible, the new owners were presumably oblivious to the history of this house and the ramshackle sheds they had destroyed. Their renovations had inadvertently destroyed what was one of the earliest institutions of Ireland's revolutionary government during the War of Independence. In the midst of the conflict, two sisters, Margaret and Rose Quinn, operated a secret prison for the IRA in this house at Pembroke Road as the revolutionary Republican government tried to establish a legal system in a country that was falling apart. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is The War of Independence, Part 16, Revolutionary Justice. Revolutions are, more often than not, sanitised in history books. They're often portrayed as the clinical work of committed revolutionaries who sweep aside an old, unjust order. The reality is that they are usually, if not always, very messy affairs which can be very, very scary experiences to live through. Crime often soars as law and order breaks down. For example, accounts from Moscow in the summer of 1917 as the old system of governance collapsed amidst the Russian Revolution were truly terrifying as criminal gangs robed the city. In these situations, the ability of a revolutionary movement to establish law and order can determine the success, or otherwise, of the revolution. If they fail to do so, their supporters can lose faith that they can actually govern a country. Now, this was precisely one of the many problems facing the republican movement in 1920 in Ireland. However, establishing a justice system brings with it tricky questions about what exactly constitutes a crime. If a poor person occupies the land of a landlord without permission, is this a crime or is it a revolutionary act? In this episode, we look at the story of revolutionary justice in Ireland during the War of Independence and how the political arm of the Republican movement attempted to establish a government in the midst of the war. This is not the story of high politics, however, but rather how this played out in the towns and villages of Ireland as traditional structures in society began to unravel. In a previous episode, I mentioned I was organising what was going to be the first live event since COVID began. This took place last Sunday, September the 19th, and it was a great day in Crohan. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Damien Lawler and Miriam Ryan for taking the time to show us through what is a remarkable landscape while telling the story of old Crohan Man. I also want to thank everyone who came, and I want to give a special shout out to James Tracy, who couldn't make it on the day. Finally, as lots of you may be aware, every fourth week, the main show takes a break for the monthly supporters Q&A with Dr. Brian Hanley, an assistant professor in the Department of History in Trinity College, Dublin. The next Q&A is coming up in a few weeks, and given the recent controversies in Ireland of late, we might look at the whole subject of commemorations and how the war is remembered a century on, because it's still a contentious subject in Ireland in 2021. Brian has contributed extensively to these debates, so it'll be fascinating to get his perspective. Now, these Q&As are exclusively available to supporters of the show at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast and Acast Plus. If you'd like to participate in the next Q&A and also get the bonus features like exclusive episodes and ad-free shows, just follow the links in the show notes below. It's really easy to sign up.
Now, let's start today's show by introducing two remarkable women, Rose and Margaret Quinn, who ran a prison in their home at Pembroke Road in Dublin during the War of Independence. Sound on today's episode is by Jason Looney. Additional research is by Sam McGrath, and the narrations, as usual, are by Therese Murray and Aidan Crowe. Like so many of Ireland's revolutionary generation, Rose and Margaret Quinn enjoyed what seems to have been a very unremarkable childhood. Born in the mid-1890s, they were the eldest girls in what was a family of 12 children. While the Quinns suffered the loss of three siblings, an experience common to many at the time, they did enjoy a childhood immune from the squalor of tenements in Dublin city centre. The family's home at Bayview Terrace on Pembroke Road in Irishtown was comparatively spacious. This four-roomed, semi-detached house offered a level of comfort to the likes of Bridget Carlin, who we met in the last episode and lived in one of those squalid tenements, could only have dreamed of. In Irishtown, which overlooked Dublin Bay, the Quinn family lived what appears to have been an uneventful life, until 1917 at least. While Rose and Margaret were in their early 20s and their brother Hugh was older still in 1916, there's no evidence any of them participated in the 1916 Rising. From what evidence does survive, however, it seems that it was a deeply personal event that had a transformative impact on all their lives. In March 1917, their father Kevin died from heart failure at the age of 53. Now, whether Kevin Quinn had acted as an obstacle or a bar to his children becoming politically active is unclear, but shortly after his death, his three eldest children all became heavily involved in Republican politics in Dublin. The eldest, Hugh, went on to join the IRA and eventually would serve as quartermaster of the local company in Irish town. Meanwhile, Rose and Margaret themselves joined the local Common Naman branch. Initially, their experience was similar to that of many Common Naman members, albeit very active ones. They carried out logistical support for the IRA, storing, oiling and cleaning weapons. The family home on Pembroke Road was also used, as many houses were, to shelter IRA volunteers on the run, but also hosted training classes when needed. The two sisters were also actively involved in the Irish Republican Prisoners Dependence Fund, which supported the families of imprisoned volunteers. However, it was in 1920, as the War of Independence was intensifying, when Margaret and Rose's experience of the war diverged from that of many of their comrades in Coming Naman. In that summer, they took on a new, unique role, but one that was very dangerous. As the war developed, the Republican movement tried to make good on its claims to be the legitimate government of Ireland, not only in name, but also in deed. And one of the most basic functions of any government is to establish a justice system. And in that summer of 1920, this was badly needed, as the old British system, as we're about to hear, was starting to collapse. It was in this context that Margaret and Rose Quinn would find themselves to the fore of efforts to establish a justice system when a covert prison was established in their house, something that had to be done completely in secret as the entire Republican movement, as we've heard in numerous episodes now, was coming under increasing scrutiny and attack from Crown forces. However, before we look at the story of this specific prison, we need to take a look at the wider situation in Ireland to understand exactly why it was established. As you've heard in earlier episodes in this series, the 73 successful Sinn Féin candidates in the general election of December 1918 had refused to travel to the Parliament of the United Kingdom in London. Instead, they had gathered in Dublin convening what was called the First Doyle, an independent Irish Parliament where they declared an Irish Republic and established their own government. While this had great propaganda value at the time, critics were able to dismiss the Doyle as nothing more than a paper tiger. Republicans in Dublin could call themselves the legitimate government of Ireland, but in reality, in early 1919, the British authorities still operated all the key institutions of state, including the island's police, its prisons and its tax system. As we've seen through the series though, the Republican movement began to undermine these institutions as the war developed. An early target had been the judicial system. The Doyle had called for Irish people to boycott the Royal Irish Constabulary and the court system, and by the summer of 1919, that was already beginning to have an impact, and by 1920, the judicial system more or less ground to a standstill. 
the quarterly assizes, or courts for hearing more serious crimes, had more or less collapsed across much of the south and west of the island as people were refusing to take cases or report crimes to the police. Meanwhile, the increase in IRA attacks made it increasingly difficult for the police to function on a day-to-day basis. While these initiatives paralysed the courts and the police, it did raise a massive question for the Republican movement. If Irish people were not going to use the courts or the police to resolve legitimate grievances, where or how was this to be done? If someone burgled your house, where were you to go? If someone assaulted you on the street, how was your assailant going to be prosecuted? Now this was not something that could be left until the revolution was won, because criminals were starting to realise that the war of independence was a rare opportunity for them too, given the police were increasingly unable to stop them. This resulted in a rise in crime as the war developed. For example, Con Meany of the IRA's Cork 1st Brigade remembered, The lawless element of the population, believing that the time was ripe for acts of lawlessness, tried to indulge in thefts and robberies. In this account, Meany went on to recall one of the most serious incidents in 1919. On November 20th, 1919, the officials of two banks, the Munster and Leinster and the National Bank, while on their way from Mill Street to Knocknagri Fair, were held up by masked and armed men at Ballyday and robbed of over £18,000. In the aftermath of this robbery, known as the Mill Street Bank Robbery, the Royal Irish Constabulary were completely unable to investigate the crime. In fact, according to Con Meany, all they did was arrest a prominent IRA volunteer in the area in an effort to tarnish the Republican movement by associating them with the crime. In this context, however, the IRA realised that something had to be done to try and tackle this rise in crime. They had, after all, undermined the previous judicial system. In the case of this robbery, the Mill Street Bank robbery, the highly respected Liam Lynch, the commander of the IRA's Cork No. 2 Brigade, was brought into Mill Street in April 1920 to oversee a trial. Having identified those responsible, IRA volunteers arrested them, recovered £10,000 and then held a five-hour trial. Sentences were passed and those convicted were exiled from the area, either to other parts of Ireland or in some cases overseas. Now while this was an ad hoc solution to one specific and particularly notorious crime, in Dublin the Doyle was developing a more formalised structure which was going to be rolled out across the island. In an effort to adopt a more systematic approach, the Republican movement fell back on the experiences of its members in the west of Ireland where they had developed a system of dealing with land-related disputes over the previous years. They had set up arbitration courts to resolve disputes between tenants and landlords in an effort to avoid open conflict breaking out over the issue of land. Now while I am going to return to that very important topic of land later on in the episode, at the moment all we have to know is that these arbitration courts provided the Doyle with a framework for their own legal system and in the summer of 1920 they formally adopted them wholesale essentially as a republican judicial system. To put it into effect Sinn Féin then directed all its branches across the country to set up these republican courts across the island. Charlie Brown an IRA activist in Cork remembered the summer of 1920 in the following terms. Republican courts were set up at this time to arbitrate on matters of litigation. Justices and judges were appointed to deal with the various types of claims. Patrick O'Connor of B Company was released from army work to take charge of this activity. A number of men from each company were detailed as Republican police and carried out all police functions. Now as this judicial system began to take hold, it was clear that prisons of one kind or another were going to be needed to hold people waiting trial. Now this brings us back to the story of Rose and Margaret Quinn, who would set up a prison in the backyard of their home in Dublin. While it was relatively safe to establish prisons in isolated farms in rural areas, setting one up in a house in a city was a different matter entirely. The Quinn sisters would essentially have prisoners detained in the back of their semi-detached house in a suburb of Dublin, which was, it goes without saying, an extremely risky endeavour. The establishment of the Republican judicial system in Dublin, and indeed across the country, began in earnest when Richard Mulcahy, the Chief of Staff of the IRA, issued an order for the establishment of a Republican police force on June 19, 1920. 
However, from the get-go, this force was massively under-resourced. In Dublin, the IRA volunteer Sean Condren was appointed to head up the Republican police in the city. However, even though Dublin's population at this point was 300,000 people, he was only given a unit of 12 volunteers to police the entire city. Now, Condren did what he could, and it was probably he who first approached Margaret and Rose Quinn about establishing a prison at their house. He had already spent time in their home on Pembroke Road and presumably knew Rose and Margaret both to be committed and capable activists who could also be trusted. It seems then that sometime in later 1920, work began on converting the yard at the back of the Quinn sisters' house into a small prison. The strange, dreary courtyard I mentioned at the start of the episode may actually have been created during these works. It doesn't appear on the 1911 maps. When complete, the prison took the form of a couple of sheds around the backyard of the house. Willie Riley, an IRA volunteer, when later testifying to Rose Quinn's involvement, talked about what went on in this prison. In 1920 and 1921, Part of her home was used as a miniature prison for men arrested and detained by the Irish Republican Police. For some months there were eight or ten men in custody for different crimes and all the food partaken by those men and their guards was cooked and served by Margaret and her sister Rose. Now there's no question that this made life for the Quinns extremely difficult. While they didn't actually guard the prisoners themselves, this would fall to IRA volunteers, they nevertheless had to provide food for what was at times well over a dozen people. Sean Condren, who I mentioned earlier, later remembered the considerable numbers who could be locked up in the house. During the police activities, I had to lock up many people on various occasions, and they were locked up in premises belonging to the Quinns. I remember on one occasion I had 16 prisoners there, and some of them were there for at least six weeks anyway. While the Quinn sisters had to provide food for these prisoners and their guards, what was happening in the prison adjoining their home may not always have been the most pleasant to hear or certainly watch. On another occasion, Sean Condren described the prison in more ominous terms when he explained, It was an unknown destination for the detention and interrogation of prisoners arrested by the Republican police. When acting under the authority of the then Minister for Home Affairs, Mr. Austin Stack. And what precisely these interrogations described by Condren involved is unclear, but given they were often dealing with criminals and gangsters and were woefully under-resourced, it may well have been very unpleasant for the Quinn sisters and their family to live beside. The risks involved in this kind of activity as well for the sisters was considerable. If Crown forces raided the Quinns, Rose and Margaret would have been hard-pressed to explain why 16 people were locked up in sheds at the back of their house being guarded by armed men. Indeed, the house was eventually raided in 1921, but on that occasion there was no prisoners present and weapons being stored in the building had already been moved off-site. Further to the risks of having their house raided by the Crown forces, the Quinns surely feared about what might happen if the prisoners in the sheds at the back of the house escaped. The Republican police in Dublin in particular often dealt with some of the city's most unsavoury characters. As I mentioned, criminals, gangsters, that type of person. And you'd have to imagine they may not have appreciated Rose and Margaret's involvement in their detention. Now, while the whole Republican police system in Dublin was massively under-resourced, the network of courts, the Republican police themselves, and the prison operated by the Quinns in the city presumably served as some form of deterrent anyway to criminals. And more importantly, probably, helped maintain a certain degree of order in the city and gave people across Dublin the sense that at least something was being done by the Republican movement as law and order was beginning to break down. Ultimately, however, the Republican police in Dublin had to deal with what was relatively straightforward cases and crimes. It was actually in the west of Ireland where things got a bit tricky. There, this emerging legal system, the Republican police and the occasional prison here and there faced huge challenges and not just because of a lack of resources. Some of the cases brought before them questioned the fine line where crime ended and revolutionary activity began. This was more about politics, really, than crime or law and order. Teasing this out would reveal some major divisions within the Republican movement that are very important, as it became clear that there were huge differences over what people hoped an independent Ireland would look like and what exactly they were fighting for. 
Hi folks, this is just a quick break to flag that if you haven't been at the shop, that's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop lately, it's well worth checking out. Now, we've added lots of new products over the summer. A favourite for listeners of the War of Independence series has always been the flag of the Irish Republic, which was raised over the GPO in 1916. You can get that in the shop, but that's now available as an enamel pin as well which is, you know, a much smaller little pin that you can stick onto your jacket or your bag or whatever. In terms of this episode, there's also pins of Cumann the Mon, which the Quinn sisters were members of. This is made from metal and has the letters of the organization resting on a rifle. It's a really lovely badge. There's also tons of great books on the site now as well, including copies of my book, Life in Medieval Ireland. Anyway, it's worth heading over to irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop to check those out. I'll put a link in the show notes below. As mentioned earlier in the show, the court system developed by the Republican movement was based on a model that had emerged in the west of Ireland around the end of the First World War, when major disputes over land were creating problems and divisions within the nationalist movement. Now, this was a bit of a thorny issue in general. Traditionally, disputes over land had been central to nationalist and Republican propaganda as they played heavily on the image of the impoverished tenant battling the all-powerful landlord supported by the British government. However, by the First World War, the nature of land conflicts and disputes in the West had changed. In many instances, it now saw poor tenants clash with large, wealthy farmers, both of whom supported independence. In this context, the Republican movement now saw disputes as a threat to the unity of the movement And in this situation, they had developed the arbitration courts mentioned earlier in the hope that they could resolve the disputes in a peaceful manner without major division. However, this, at best, was only papering over a huge crack in the wider support base of the movement in the west of Ireland. Given that 20% of farms were too small to provide a reasonable standard of living to the families who lived on them, the poor desperately needed land. And when the War of Independence began and British authority began to collapse, this demand for land developed into a full-blown agrarian revolution in some communities in the West. The poor no longer waited for decisions of arbitration courts that potentially might seek to appease both sides. Kevin O'Sheill, a prominent Republican judge, would later recall this revolution, which saw land forcibly redistributed in many instances by the poor. All bonds were broken. And a fever swept through with the fury of a prairie fire over Connacht and portions of other provinces. The poor recognised that they were living through what was a historic opportunity that might not be repeated. There was essentially no government in place from late 1919 onwards that could stop them. Their actions often took the form of what was called a cattle drive, where hundreds of local people gathered to drive the cattle of ranchers, basically large farmers, off the land so it could be used by smaller farmers. Air Court in East Galway was the focus of major upheaval, and this account gives a sense of one of these cattle drives. On Thursday last, the first farm to be driven was that occupied by Mr. E. Horsman Mielek. This drive attracted a large number of men from the surrounding parishes, as this farm was the object of considerable agitation during the Land League days. The crowd gathered the stock and drove them home to the owner's residence at Whitehall Mielek. On arrival there they gave them up and warned him not to put them back again or trouble would result. The drivers then proceeded to another farm held by Mr. Horsman and cleared off the stock. Derry Farm, containing 60 acres owned by Mr. James Horsman Ballycrossane, was next visited by the same crowd. The stock were driven onto the road and a procession started for the owner's residence which is four miles distant. The drivers were accompanied by a string of cars. On reaching Mr Horsman's the people were informed that the owner was not at home so they delivered the cattle to his sons and told them to evacuate the farm as it was needed for the small farmers in the district. On returning to Air Court, the crowd received a great ovation. Large farmers who refused the demands of these activists were often sent threatening letters with skulls and coffins drawn on them to reinforce the point. In one case, a resolute landowner was forced to sell his farm at gunpoint while a grave was dug before him 
Other negotiation tactics included bringing a coffin to the house of a big farmer as an inducement to sell. Now these tactics were about as far from arbitration courts as you can get. This militancy, however, created a major crisis for the Republican leadership. More conservative leaders were outraged. Arthur Griffith, for example, was appalled by what was happening in the west of Ireland, saying it threatened to wreck the movement. Cahill Brewer took a different approach and as Minister for Defence said it was basically a distraction from the war. Many feared it would break up the nationalist movement along class lines. It also raised a far more fundamental question one the Republican leadership had avoided, and that is, what exactly was the long-term aim of the movement? What kind of state were they building? Who would be top dog? Would it be the rich farmers, or would it be the poor tenants? While it was not a universally held view, the general position of the leadership was that a revolution from below, where the poor farmers took the land for themselves, was dangerous and should be opposed. Many in the leadership came from professional backgrounds and had much to lose if a revolution of this type began to spread and challenged the economic structure of society. This was evident, for example, when the Republican judge, Kevin O'Shiel, claimed that this land agitation was a grave menace to life and property. This was a very selective understanding of violence and political violence at the time and revealed the conservative attitude among men like O'Shiel. A central tenet of the Republican movement had been the right to use political violence to achieve independence. However, some Republican leaders were now trying to deny that same right to the poor who were trying to escape grinding poverty. Ultimately, in an effort to control these events, Sinn Féin instead decided that from 1920 onwards, all land claims had to go through the Republican court system. This was an effort to control the agrarian revolution, although this was often easier said than done, and it certainly sowed the seeds of disillusionment among supporters of the movement, as well as some IRA volunteers. It is worth saying at this point, before we move on with the story, that some prominent Republicans did support a more far-reaching revolution. Pather O'Donnell, for example, whose life was covered in the series Partisans, was a trade union organiser with the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, as well as a prominent IRA volunteer in the North West. As a socialist, O'Donnell wanted the Irish Revolution to develop into a full-blown socialist transformation of society. Others, such as Liam Meadows, articulated similar views. Now, while the political end of the Republican movement increasingly tried to operate as a government, the limits of this were realised when the British government refused to fund basic services in Ireland from the summer of 1920 onwards. This was a cynical but really clever move on the part of the British government because it placed enormous pressure on the fledgling Republican government operating in the shadows on a shoestring budget. They just couldn't step into the breach when the British government withdrew funding and the most vulnerable in society suffered. In the first half of 1920, Sinn Féin had completely dominated a series of local elections held across Ireland. This saw numerous local authorities such as city corporations and county councils fall under their control. Sinn Féin followed up on this huge propaganda victory by switching the allegiance of these local bodies they now controlled from the British administration in Westminster to the Doyle. This was significant because they could point out to people at home and abroad that they were now in reality becoming the de facto government of Ireland. However, in the summer of 1920, the British government responded to this with a masterful but utterly cynical move. On July the 29th, they announced that if local authorities wanted to swear allegiance to the Doyle, they would cut off all funding to these bodies. Now, there was no way the Republican movement could bridge the gap, and given these local authorities provided essential services to some of the most marginalised in Irish society, this had dire consequences. As funds started to dry up in later 1920, workhouses, the last port of call of the destitute, faced cutbacks and in some cases the authorities had no option but to turn what were called able-bodied men out of these institutions. There was a very good reason these people were in workhouses in the first place. Finding work was increasingly difficult in an economy that was heading into a deep recession. The budgets of asylums were also slashed in later 1920 as funds dried up. This had major consequences. For example, the Sligo Asylum accrued debts of £12,000 by the end of 1920 and this resulted in wage cuts across the board. Even a doctor had to be let go. Unsurprisingly, awful decisions had to be made. 
and in Sligo a list of 170 patients who were to be forcibly discharged was drawn up in the asylum. These patients were then sent to their families and if they refused to take them in, they were sent on to the workhouse. Inevitably, some, unfairly it should be said, blamed the Republican movement, as the British government presumably hoped. For example, when one worker in the Sligo Asylum heard of these cuts, they blamed the Republican movement, saying, It was too bad to find Sinn Féin, representatives of the Irish Republic, treating the workers in such a manner. This underlines the difficulties and depths of the challenges facing the political arm of the Republican movement through the War of Independence. To make matters worse, many IRA volunteers were dismissive of their efforts, seeing political work as less important than armed struggle. Many didn't want to join the Republican police, and a Mead Sinn Féin activist complained that Prominent volunteers seemed to encourage amongst them the feeling of contempt for the political side of the movement. Indeed, the IRA general headquarters articulated similar views when they commented during the war. The plain fact is... Our civil services have played at governing a republic, while the soldiers have not played at dying for it. Overall, the republican politicians who tried to create a shadow government and legal system had a limited impact in day-to-day life during the war. From late 1920 onwards, it was almost impossible for this government to function due to repression. Yet, the wider political work that they engaged in was extremely important, as we'll see in coming episodes. By early 1921, it was becoming increasingly clear the war could not be won on the battlefield alone. Indeed, if it was a purely military struggle, the IRA would unquestionably lose against the near endless resources of the British Army. However, while they faced challenges, the decisions taken by the political arm of the Republican movement cannot be excused by the difficulties they faced. In some instances, as we've seen in this episode, they reveal the deeply conservative attitude to the economy and society, and it is possible to trace some of the austere policies that shaped the post-independence free state as far back as this period in the War of Independence. But that's a story for a later episode. In the next show, we'll be looking at the story of the IRA in Britain during the war. Don't forget to check out the shop, that's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Until next time, Sloan.